today I'm going to really be just kind of talking about this is her story, the divine feminine history of cannabis. Um, so this is what I'm going to be focused on today. This is just a little uh, preview of what we're going to what I'm going to be talking about. So some of the the historical um, medical uses and some of the, the uh, preparations that that were used. And then I'm going to talk about cannabis in the 21st century and kind of what women are still using cannabis for and what the research uh, says. So we're going to talk about dysmenorrhea, infertility, pregnancy, breastfeeding, menopause, and just kind of the, the future of where, you know, I think cannabis uh, could and should go when it comes to women's health. So I want to dedicate this, uh, this really, this presentation to all of the women in my life. This is me and my crew of girlfriends. We're at the Emerald Cup, which is the really one of the most amazing um, sun-grown cannabis uh, events in the United States. And if it wasn't for the, the sisterhood and all of my close friends um, and their support, I, I wouldn't be here today. So I just wanted to give a shout out to all my girls. A lot of my girlfriends are here today. So love you guys. Um, so let's see here. I'm going to just start off with uh, some of the history. So we're going to start with Egypt. Uh, so in Egypt, cannabis was called Azalu and uh, it was used in the seventh century. Uh, and hemp was combined with mint, saffron, and beer to aid in the difficulty of child uh, of childbirth and also for um, the, the stain of menses. It was administered orally, vaginally, rectally, through fumigation, and also as eye drops, which I found was really, was really fascinating um, that they were they were using it and eye drops that that long ago. Uh, cannabis has remained in um, the Egyptian pharmacopoeia since since pharaonic times. Um, oh, sorry, hold on just a second. I have to escape this. Sorry, I'm having a. There we go. Okay, so. Persia, uh, cannabis was called banga. And um, I, I think it's so, so fascinating too, what, uh, what different herbs and, and combinations that, that were used. So um, one of the interesting ones was a intranasal preparation uh, of cannabis. So it was the seed juice mixed with a variety of herbs to treat migraines, um, calm uterine pain, and also to uh, prevent miscarriage. Cannabis was also used for um, the, the discharge for gonorrhea, diarrhea, for anal, anal fissures after, after childbirth. Um, and then they were also, poultices were used for um, hysteria, dysmenorrhea, and uh, relief from, from, uh, from hemorrhoids as well. So China, where cannabis is called ma, it's uh, the symbol for ma is the two cannabis plants um, hung upside down to dry. The, the red emperor Shen Nung, who you know, really has such a, a vast library of, um, of cannabis uh, treatment and, and um, he was really one of the first to differentiate the, the difference between the female plants and the, and the male plants. And um, just that, you know, the, the female plants had uh, stronger concentrations of, uh, of, you know, cannabinoids and terpenes. They were used as an anesthetic. Uh, the cannabis flowers were used for, for menstrual disorders um, and also um, in the postpartum time. The, the juice was used for retained placentas and also for uh, postpartum hemorrhage or postpartum bleeding. So Europe, cannabis was called Hainep. And um, this is really, I, I really uh, loved this, uh, this kind of quote where it's 
rub the herb with fat, lay it to the breast, it will disperse the swelling. If there is a gathering of diseased matter, it will purge it. So this might have been one, um, you know, where they're writing about um, cannabis and the and topical to use in, in perhaps breast cancer. Um, hemp seed was used to increase uh, breast milk production and to help with a amenorrhea. So that's if you are uh, not having a period. And um, again, we see the the resin of hemp tincture used for for uterine hemorrhage and used to um, increase uterine contractions during labor. Uh, and then when we come to the the United States. So this is actually a, um, a, a formula that was created specifically for women uh, for period pain um, uh, and uh, by a pharmaceutical company. So I think it's really uh, interesting too that this has uh, not only cannabis, but it has capsation in it which you know, all of the, the cannabis nerds know out there that, that capsation um, opens the, the trip B receptor, which is part of the endocannabinoid system. So this was probably a really great formula when it comes to, um, to cannabis and to using it for uh, dysmenorrhea. Um, Again, used for pain, painful periods, also used for hyperemesis gravida. So hyperemesis gravida is during pregnancy when you have excessive um, nausea and vomiting. It's not just morning sickness, it's essentially morning sickness on steroids. Oftentimes women are, um, you know, today, hospitalized for it, given IV fluids, given IV medications. Um, and so it's, it can be quite serious because it, it can, um, you know, de decrease the, the growth of the baby. And it can also be really harmful for the mother as well. Um, Menorrhagia, so again, uh, excessive bleeding, um, cessation of menstruation, and also during difficult labor. Um, and again, this is, I had to include this one because this is another one of my favorite just kind of cannabis as medicine quotes. Uh, so cannabis indica does not paralyze the nerves, but strengthens them directly. It does not constipate by paralysis, but it, it cures by its uh, beneficent virtue. So really just kind of talking about, um, you know, not uh, suppressing symptoms, but actually uh, healing at the, at the root, um, the root cause. And so this is some of the historical uses uh, that we have seen throughout the world that women have used cannabis for. Uh, so gonorrhea, menstrual cramps, heavy periods, uterine uh, fibroids. It's been used as a aphrodisiac for nausea, hyperemesis gravidum during pregnancy to stop labor, to decrease labor pain, to expel the placenta after labor. So really this was very um, common uh, in the use with, with midwives, as, as you can tell. Um, nipple cracks and, and fissures from breastfeeding and also to treat mastitis where, um, you know, when you're breastfeeding, it can be a complication of it. Uh, the symptoms of menopause, including the flashes of heat and cold, uh, breast, cervical and uterine cancer, cystitis when um, you have the inflammation of your, your urinary tract and, and urinary retention and in, in incontinence. So cannabis into the 21st century. So, you know, what we see women using cannabis for is very similar to what they used it for uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, so dysmenorrhea, also known as uh, painful periods, 84% of women have painful periods at some point in their life. So Pretty much every woman in this 
in this uh, Zoom meeting has either had a painful period or knows somebody who, who has them. Um, almost half of all women have painful periods every month. So can you imagine every month for two to three, sometimes the entire week, having painful periods, going to work, going to school, carrying on with your life while being in intense pain? So about half of the women do that. And one in 10 have been um, clinically diagnosed with endometriosis, which is where um, the lining of your uterus grows on the outside instead of on the inside, which leads not only to painful periods, but can also lead to infertility. Um, cannabinoids have been uh, shown to decrease pain, but also to decrease the spread of endometrial lesions in the pelvic region. So right now, when we look at the treatment for endometriosis, it's basically a uh, you know, surgical uh, birth control to suppress periods. But when we look at it from the standpoint of the endocannabinoid system, we see that uh, cannabinoids actually help to um, decrease the, the amount of, of spread, you know, because it's anti-proliferative. So, um, so cannabis and infertility. So I wanted to just kind of touch on this a little bit. This has been um, several studies that have been coming out over the past decade. Um, so just kind of to define infertility. So women who, you know, are, are having unprotected sex, who are trying to get pregnant, um, who, you know, don't get pregnant within a year. That's for women who are um, under 35, women who are over 35, it changes to uh, six months. Um, so 12% of the women in the United States have difficulty getting pregnant or they have difficulty carrying a pregnancy to term. So what we, what we kind of have, have been seen is that uh, when you have the implantation of the embryo to the, into the uterus, you actually need a, a drop of, of anandamide, uh, which is an endogenous uh, cannabinoid. Um, so THC can inhibit the implantation of the embryo in the uterus. So, you know, really for, for clinicians, when you have, you know, this this uh, population of women trying to, to get pregnant, you might um, encourage other methods of cannabis use, perhaps a, a topical, um, but to, to maybe uh, uh, decrease the amount of, of THC that they're using. So pregnancy and cannabis. So cannabis uh, in pregnancy, it's very controversial as you can imagine. Um, so the studies are very limited. Um, but when there's no co-founding factors like alcohol or, or tobacco, what we see is that um, cannabis can decrease the decreased birth rate weight, um, and it, it may contribute to ADHD. Uh, cannabis can also aid in hyperemesis gravidum, which is what we had, uh, what I had talked about a little bit earlier, where it's the severe uh, vomiting, cyclic vomiting during pregnancy. And so I, I think that, you know, that would be a choice for the, for the individual, you know, woman. And, and certainly, you know, what we, we see with involvement in, in CPS and, and cannabis and women, it's something to like really look at, at policy and, and legislation. Um, so cannabis and, and breastfeeding. So again, these are very small, um, very small studies. Uh, so this one was, uh, it's kind of an older study, but it didn't see a, a difference in and growth, mental or motor development after about a year. Um, and, and this was a pretty small, it was about 28 uh, children. What we, babies, what we do know is that the half-life of THC in breast milk is about 27 hours. So that's how long um, THC is in the breast milk. And the estimated intake 
for um, the infant is about 2.5% of what the of what the mother used. So it's a very, very low um, amount. So really the, the big take home method message for this is that dose matters. Um, so when you're using larger amounts of THC, uh, larger amounts are, are passed on. So again, um, just, you know, when, when advising uh, my patients, I always, you know, just talk to them a, about the, the amount and decreasing the amount and considering alternative uh, methods uh, such as, as topicals. Um, so cannabis and menopause. So cannabinoids, um, CBD, CBG, and THCV uh, have been shown to kind of uh, strengthen the bone. So it uh, helps with the osteoclasts in, um, in kind of uh, increasing the, the bone production. Uh, so therefore kind of it can decrease the risk of osteoporosis. Cannabis can increase the, the serotonin level, which helps, which can help to decrease hot flashes. And uh, some cannabis products can be used for lubrication. So there is a huge market for that now. I'm sure a lot of you have, have seen those on the market. Um, but that's kind of how women are using it uh, throughout through menopause, just to kind of help with some of the, the side effects that they may be experiencing. Um, so the future is female. This is with two of my most favorite uh, women in cannabis. So Dr. Sue Sisley, and um, this is my girl, Jenny. She's actually um, an, an attorney in Northern California and a, a part of uh, of, of normal as well. So, so really, you know, what, what do we, what do we need at, as women? Um, so I'm, I'm really calling for more research on, on women's health issue, issues and cannabis, especially when we're looking at some of the efficacy for, um, you know, conditions like endometriosis. So I did a PubMed search. This was in, um, this was about a year and a half ago, and there were zero articles on cannabis and, and dysmenorrhea, which is kind of insane. Um, 644 articles on, on cannabis and pregnancy, 34 articles on cannabis and breast cancer, and about three articles on um, cannabis and menopause. So really um, just looking towards providing um, funding for this important research to happen. Um, and also product development um, for, for, for um, you know, conditions that we know that cannabis helps with, uh, like specifically for dysmenorrhea. I know that we've seen kind of a, a smothering, um, of, of products out there, but just kind of some more focus on, on um, you know, cannabis specifically uh, targeting dysmenorrhea and really supporting women in cannabis, supporting those amazing uh, female cannabis brands. Um, you know, Ohm Edibles is totally one of my favorites, um, but really just supporting women in, in cannabis. Another is Kiskanu. These are all on, on, the, on the West Coast. 